The Brother Avenged by George Barrow. Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. The Brother Avenged. I stood before my master's board, the skinker's office plying. The herald men brought tidings then that my brother was murdered lying. I followed my lord unto his bed. By his dearest down he laid him. Then my courser out of the stall I led, and with saddle and bit arrayed him. I sprang upon my courser's back, with a spur began to goad him, and ere I drew his bridle too, full fifteen leagues I rode him. And when I came to the noisy hall, where the Kemp's carouse were keeping, oh then I saw my mother dear, o'er the course of my brother weeping. Then I laid an arrow on my good bow, the bow that never deceived me, and straight I shot the king's Kempians twelve, of my brother who had bereaved me. And then to the ting I rode away, where the judges twelve were seated, of six to avenge my brother I begged, and of six protection entreated. For the third time I rode to the ting, for deep revenge I lusted, up stood the liegeman of the king, and at me fiercely thrusted. Up stood the liegeman of the king, with a furious thrust toward me, and the judges twelve rose in the ting, and an outlaw man declared me. Then I laid an arrow on my good bow, and the bow to its utmost bent eye, and into the heart of the king's liegeman the sharp, sharp arrow sent I. Then away from the ting amain I sped, my good steed clomb in hurry. There was nothing for me but to hasten and flee, and myself among the woods to bury. And hidden for eight long years I lay, amid the woods so lonely, I had nothing to eat in the dark retreat, but grass and green leaves only. I had nothing to eat in the dark retreat, save the grass and leaves I devoured. No bedfellows crept to the place where I slept, but bears that brooned and roared. So near at hand was the holy tide of Our Lady of Mercy's tender. The King of the Swedes his followers leads and rides to the church in splendor. So I laid an arrow on my good bow as I looked from the gap so narrow, and into the heart of the Swedish king I sent the yard-long arrow. Now lies on the ground the Swedish king and the blood from his death wound showers. So blithe is my breast, though still I must rest amid the forest bowers. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Eyes by George Borrow, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. To kiss a pair of red lips small, full many a lover's sighs. If I kiss anything at all, let it be Sophie's eyes, the eyes, the eyes whose witcheries have filled my heart with care. Too dear I prize the eyes, the eyes of Sophie Ribopierre. Were I the czar, my kingly crown, my troops and victories, and fair renown, I'd all lay down to kiss but Sophie's eyes. The charming eyes, whose witcheries have filled my heart with care, too dear I prize the charming eyes of Sophie Ribopierre. Perhaps I've seen a fairer face, though hers may well surprise, a form perhaps of lovelier grace, but oh, the eyes, the eyes the matchless eyes whose witcheries have filled my heart with care. I well may prize the matchless eyes of Sophie Ribofier. What with the polished diamond stone can vie beneath the skies? Oh, it is vied and far outshone by Sophie's beaming eyes. But Sophie's eyes whose witcheries have filled my heart with care, well may I prize the beaming eyes of Sophie Ribopierre. The sun of June burns furiously, and brooks and meadows dries. But, oh, with more intensity burn cruel Sophie's eyes. The wicked eyes, whose witcheries have filled my heart with care. Too dear I prize the wicked eyes of Sophie Ribopierre. 
oh soon beneath their piercing ray like some parched plant which dies whither shall i poor youth away and all for sophie's eyes but bless the eyes whose witcheries have filled my heart with care till death i'll prize and bless the eyes of sophie ribaupierre end of poem this recording is in the public domain Harmodius and Aristogiton by George Borrow, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Harmodius and Aristogiton, from the Greek. With the leaves of the myrtle I'll cover my brand, like Harmodius and Aristogiton of yore, when the tyrant they slew and their dear native land they caused with just laws to be governed once more o oh, beloved harmodius thou still art not dead in the isles of the blest thou still livest they say where the swift-heeled achilles and bold diomed through sweet flowery meadows continually stray with the leaves of the myrtle i'll cover my blade like harmodius and aristogiton of yore who whilst the high rites to athena were paid the bold tyrant hipparchus extended in gore and on earth ever ever your glory shall glow harmodius and aristogiton sun bright because ye the damnable tyrant laid low and restored to your country her law and her right end of poem this recording is in the public domain My Dainty Dame by George Borrow Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo My Dainty Dame My Dainty Dame, my heart's delight, Star of my watch, serene and bright, Come to the greenwood, mild as May, Cozy the arbors, come away, And me thy spouse and servant see, To Sylvan Hall I'll usher thee, Thy bed shall be the leaves heaped high, thy organs note the cuckoo's cry thy covert warm the kindly wood no fairer form therein e'er stood thy dress my beauteous gem shall be soft foliage stripped from forest tree the foliage best the forest bore served as a garb for eve of yore thou too throughout the summer day shalt rove around in eve's array my eve thou art my ever dear thy adam i'll attend and cheer come to the greenwood come away the floor with grass and flowers is gay there neath no tree shalt thou descry in churlish guise old jealousy fear not my love afar is now the loon thy tiresome lord i trow to all a jest amidst his clan he collar deals in cardigan here nestled nigh the sounding sea an eye for his bush will ever be more bliss for us our fate propounds on taft's green bank than tyvee's bounds thy caitiff white is scare aware where now we lurk my little fair ah better here in love's sweet thrall to hark the cuckoo's hearty call than pine through life in castle hall end of poem this recording is in the public domain Grassach a bow by George Borrow, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Grassach a bow, or the cause of grace. O Bailina Corte, thy turrets are tall, descried from their top is the oncoming foe. Though numerous the warriors that watch on thy wall, thy hope and thy trust are in Grassach a bow. O Bailina Corte, thy chieftains abound with courage no dangers can ever lay low in the day of the fight can their equals be found when is roared to the heavens heights grassach a bow o bailina corte brave helps thou hast nigh will rise at thy summons full quickly i trow the shortles ruthes sheaths clans so mighty and high will rise on the foemen of grassach a bow o bailina corte thy banner shall bound blood-red in the winds over the battle that blow 
when thy lion so gallant breathes terror around and thy soldiers are shouting out grasach a bow o bailina corte thy armory boasts the arms of great chiefs on the wall in a row gilly patrick let fall and o more of the host when they ran in red rout before grasach a bow o bailina corte when blazed the bright swords thy sons gave the butlers a signal overthrow when desmond was scattered with all his dark hordes he loathed the wild war-whoop of grasach abo o bailina corte thou needest no aid of strangers the day when the blood torrents flow the brenners powers parcels with buckler and blade shall triumph and feast with the grasach abo o bailina corte thy bards hope to praise thee thee through long ages undarkened with woe and him thy brave chieftain his bountiful ways and the heroes who bleed for the grasach a bow end of poem this recording is in the public domain dagma by george borrow read for librivox dot org by sonia dagmar sick in ribe dagmar's lying soon she'll be in ringstead's wall all the dames in denmark dwelling unto her she bids them call fetch me four fetch five i pray ye fetch me those for wisdom famed fetch sir karl of Havis sister little kirstin is she named fetch the old and fetch the youthful fetch the learned unto me fetch the lovely little kirstin worthy all respect is she canst thou read and write my darling canst thou ease the pains i bear thou shalt ride upon my coursers and the ruddy scarlet wear could i read and write my lady blithely i would do the same thy pains are then iron harder tis with grief i that proclaim twas the lovely little kirstin took the book and read a space ah thy pains then steel are harder god almighty help thy case End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Elf Bride by George Borrow. Read for LibriVox.org by Justin Smith. There was a youthful swain one day, did Ted the new mown grass. There came a gay and lovely May from out the nigh morass. Clad in a dress of silk was she green as the leaves which deck the tree her head so winsomely to see with bulrush plaited was that lass he wooed his suit she heeds and married are the pair to bridal bed his wife he leads but what befell him there he found fear stricken and amazed that he a rough oak trunk embraced instead of the enchanting waist of his mysterious fair then straight abroad a voice he heard, which sang the window through. These were the words the voice proffered, if my report be true. Come out to her whom thou didst wed, upon my med thy couch is spread. From this he guessed with some elf maid that he had had to do. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Treasure Digger by George Barrow Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo The Treasure Digger Oh, would that with last and shoe I had stayed Without wild desires And ah, no trust in Satan had laid That prince of liars Each Saturday night when slept the rest Away I strolled to the forest so murky and drear in quest of buried gold and then i beheld the hopping fire glow the briar behind and down to the earth my wishing rod low itself declined i dug then and gripped the chest ring amain and held it stout but the copper deceitful burst in twain and the fiends laughed out just just as long was the treasure my own 
as I trembled with fright, but soon as I held it secure, down, down, it sank from sight. Ye devilish pack, what grin ye at? I fell not your prey. I'll trust no more in old woman's chat and in crossed shaped way. I go by my last and shoe to stay without wild desires, and ne'er more in Satan I trust will lay that prince of liars. End a poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Fisher by George Barrow, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. The fisherman saddleth his good winged horse, to be on the deep seems to him his best course. Against the white strand, loud and hoarse, the wave breaks, and towards the strand now the fisherman makes. And up when the fisher his fishing line drew, a fine golden fish on the hook met his view. Then he laughed in his beard. I've a fish seen a store, but ne'er one with golden cloth kirtle before. If I a gold piece for each gold scaled possessed, with poverty I should no more be distressed. With its tail the fish gan the beach furious to smite, and a strange dance it seemed to the fisherman's sight. Thou wealthy man, be not, I pray thee, so gay, a much quieter part a poor fisher should play. The golden fish heard every word as it lay, began straight to talk and discourse in this way. I'm full as rich, fisherman, as thou art poor, and soon for thee happiness I will procure. Straight cast me again in the ocean my home, and a well-doing man thou, I swear, shalt become. The queen of the ocean my mother is, no, she linen and bolsters on thee shall bestow. My father is king in the depths of the sea, and healthy and strong he shall cause thee to be. My lover, he sorrows for me in the brine, my golden cloth kirtle shall also be thine. For the sovereign of fishes I care not a straw, on myself if I did, I but laughter should draw. For thy mother's fine cushions I cared little more, my own queen could make better wear any hour. But if thou to a wooer thy troth didst allot, the repose of two lovers destroy I will not. The trembling gold fish in the water placed he, from such wretched captures the Lord preserve me. If to-morrow a like one upon my hook bite, I shall perish of hunger, poor miserable wight. He the rest of the day sat at home by his hearth, and spake not a word that repeating his worth. He early next morn in his boat his seat took, and straightway adjusted a bait to his hook. And soon as he had overboard cast the fish line, the float it descended deep, under the brine then he laughed in his beard and with bitterness said a catch of another gold fish i have made the thin lengthy line he updrew half unwilling and behold there upon the hook hung a gold shilling and i can forsooth and for certain say that he for delight had no rest the whole day but as oft as the line he updrew from the tide upon the hook never a fish he descried for whene'er for the fish he upon the hook sought, he found that a shilling of gold he had caught. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Cuckoo by George Borrow Read for LibriVox.org by Justin Smith Abiding an appointment made, Upon the weed-grown steep I stayed, one morning mild when May was new, and fresh the down was fraught with dew. The meads were flowering, bright the woods, the branches yielding thousand buds. My lips employed in song the while, on morphid of the merry smile. Twas then as round I cast my eye, with mighty wish the maid to spy. Though howsoe'er my sight I strained, no glimpse of morphid I obtained. I heard the cuckoo's voice arise, singing the song which most I prize. To each bar true most sweet, I trow, his music on the mountain's brow. Therefore, as called by courtesy, 
I greeted him in poesy. Good day, dear cuckoo, with thy strain, a herald thou from heaven's domain. To us the tidings thou dost bear, of summer, blissful season fair. Of summer, which to greenwood shade, entices forth the bard and maid, which decks the foliage, dents the grove, and through all nature breathes of love. O oh, dear to me that note of thine, it seasons love like choicest wine. Whilst doting fondness to chastise, what cutting taunt in cuckoo lies. But pretty bird, I pray declare, where lingereth now my lady fair? O oh, poet, what delusion great doth fill this year thy foolish pate? Tis harboring a useless pain, one thought of her to entertain. With all her store of winning charms, she weds her to another's arms. Believe me when I say to thee, a mate of thine she may not be. Hush, hush, I'll not believe thy voice. Dare not defame my bosom's choice. That nymph, the fairest neath the sun, has sworn an oath, a solemn one. She vowed by her baptismal right, beneath the bough one blessed night, her hand my own and clasping hard, to live and die with me, her bard. The minister that mystic night was Madog Benfris, matchless white. Her suitors all may vainly sigh. How should she wed? Whom wed have I? Tis false, O bird, what thou dost state, and waste of time with thee to prate. Folly and drunkenness, tis plain, have got possession of thy brain. Hence with thy news and get thee cool. Thou art, I fear, a very fool. O oh, Daphid, who the fool but thou? Talking this guise beneath the bough, Another husband chooses she, Whose charms deceitful captured thee. The damsel of the neck of snow Is now another's wife, I trow. To love another's looks not well, The bough-bock owns the blooming bell. For what thou hast sung within the grove, With malice filled about my love, May days of winter come with speed, The summer and the sun recede, Hoar frost upon the foliage fall, The woods and branches withering all. And thou with piercing cold be slain, Thou horrid bird of hateful strain. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of The Brother Avenged and Other Ballads by George Borrow.